Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me. And today, my special guest is Paul and Kristen Chiaccia, correct? Yes. Good. <laughs> okay. That's and they good. are in the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. I have a connection with the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they have the Angry Catholic Podcast. You can see the sign right behind yeah. them, theangrycatholic.com. And um, I want them to tell a little bit about their story of why they started uh, this podcast. And thank you for joining me, Paul and Kristen. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you. Um, I did a little research on you guys. La in 2019, you got there was an AP article written about you, and then there was Ars there was also an article in U.S. News and World Report. Did you oh. know that was just yes? Okay. <laughs> I forgot about that, I guess. <laughs> That's pretty good, yeah. I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> yeah. So why why did you start a, a Catholic podcast? You're a, you're a, a married couple, a Catholic couple. And um, what what uh, inst 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 instigated you starting this this Catholic podcast? Uh we really, we were kind of boxed into a corner. We really felt like we had no choice but to go public with the information that we had at the time, because in 2013, our sons had served for a priest who in 2013 was arrested with a 15 year old boy he found on Craigslist. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that was quite a shock to us, we, we didn't find out about it from our diocese. We've we, 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 we never been contacted, matter of fact, from our diocese about this as parents. And when we, you know, we saw this in the newspaper, obviously we were outraged, but we, we, we really thought it was an isolated incident. Obviously this, this guy had some problems and it wasn't until the Pennsylvania grand jury report came out in 2018 and actually it was it was Chris that had had said I had to read this one case this Father Al Libatori case which is it was a huge case in the Diocese of Scranton and that was it for me I mean I, I knew at that point we had to do something we weren't sure what we were going to do but that that was really my catalyst like this has got to stop this What's is crazy and then we found out since then uh, and we find out more every every week, actually. Mm -hmm. We found out our, our bishop, in fact, knew about all the problem behaviors of this particular priest that was arrested. And that, that it was such, you know, every time we hear something like that, it's just a shocker. Even though we know, and, and we've just, we've been doing this for years now. So you'd think nothing would shock you, but it's over and over and over. We hear these stories where the bishop was aware of what was going on the entire time he knew, and they, they choose not to do anything about it. Was, was this? And they didn't want to talk about it. You know, was, that's the other yeah. part. I think that's why we started the podcast, because we were like, they didn't want to talk. The, our bishop came out um, after the McCarrick revelations, after the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, and he came out and had us watch a DVD on a Sunday in church explaining all that he does with Virtus training and he's trained over 30,000 people. We actually got up and left with our family and waited until his presentation was done and came back in because we both looked at each other and said like, like I'm not gonna sit and be lied to anymore. And, and we had known enough by reading the Father Ali Baratori case and some other cases that he wasn't being forthright about his role so we left and we realized over time as we reached out to media in our area and other faithful catholics that this was not going to be discussed anymore yeah. they didn't want to talk about it and we thought no this needs to be talked about the whole truth needs to be brought to light and partly because as parents we have kids in their 20s and we have teenagers Right. They're going to leave this church if we don't talk about it. They're right. going to lose their faith if we don't talk about it. And this faith is the most important thing we give our children. So that's kind of where we started our podcast to talk about it. We naively thought if we brought some facts to the attention of people, 
that our bishop would would come clean and and that people or that people would demand he give answers. We've learned that was rather naive, um, and we're still talk, trying to talk about it. <laughs> now this now this predator priest that Paul was talking about was this at your parish, where your where your sons were serving as altar boys or? No, I was I homeschool my children, okay. so this priest very kindly uh, let us meet there. And it was a homeschool group of faithful Catholics. And every Monday we would get there early and the boys would get to serve. And then we would have our certain classes. With him. And we became very, um, very close. I mean, he became a friend of our families. Wow. So, so your son served mass with this, this priest. Mm -hmm. For, for almost a couple of years, right? Yes. Yes. And we, we, he tried to keep in touch a little with us after he had taken a, a leave of absence. We naively thought he had said it was for his father to help because his father was sick. And then he came back and then he took a quick leave of absence again. Was in no. another parish. Yeah. yeah. And during that leave of absence, he actually contacted me, asked us about job possibilities, if we knew anything and then when he was back in a parish again, he reached out to my son, tried to Facebook friend him. My son let me know. And then he reached out to me thinking he was, I was how, my daughter. How old was your son? And then he was found, that, pardon me? How old was your son at that time when he tried to reach he out? He was 16. 16, 16, yeah. He was, he was a minor. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, yes, so, yes. Yeah. So people that don't know or maybe aren't Catholic, I mean, when you're an altar server, you're alone with the priest at times in the sacristy. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know if my son, I know, I think they both were in there or it was him and a friend. I don't know. We've talked to him and he thankfully did not experience any abuse. And wasn't made, he felt, ever to feel uncomfortable. Well, that was one of the moments, too, Joe, that um, when, when I was thinking about this as a father, and I was thinking, thank God that he didn't harm one of my kids, or I'd be in jail right now. That, and yeah. it was literally at the end of that thought process that I went, wow, what a hypocrite I'm being. Like, you know, what does it matter that it was my kid? It, it, it matters that it, it was a 15 year old boy. And it was like in that, you know, I don't know that, that understanding when I'm, when I'm, when I was really frustrated and en enraged about this, I'm like, I, you know, I can't be a hypocrite. You know, somebody has to do something about this. And what we had thought initially was what, what you had um, alluded to earlier was, you know, we would just, go into the public you know, sphere, do a podcast, do this program. And we figured in a year, we'd wrap this thing up. Everybody would know, they would be enraged, things would change. And we couldn't have been further, uh, you know, it couldn't have been further from what, what's happened. Like we, 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 we discover new things. I think the next 10 years, it's just gonna be one after another, after another, after another of, of, of what has happened in these dioceses around the country and we're going to be inundated with these stories because they've never once not not that we know of, we don't know to date any any ch abuse that happened in the church that was actually investigated properly so the, the bishops are not doing an investigation no, properly because we don't they don't even find out who was surrounding and who enabled these you know, sick men to go abuse people, but we don't even know that we we're having to find out on our own through, you know, fortunately people reach out to us and they share information with us and we're able to kind of put the pieces together, but the, the diocese, the bishops should be doing this. They, because they could, we've, we've said for a couple of years now, they could fix this problem overnight. Well, it, it, I, yeah, yes. sorry, sorry, Christian. I mean, <laughs> no, no. No. yeah, go ahead. No, just to just to bounce off what Paul said real quick, the bishops don't investigate these this problem because they are the enablers, right? Well, that that's it, and 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 the people 
in positions of power and authority in our chancery. And it sounds like pretty much everywhere else as well. So it, it seemed, we thought, you know, we're, we're like, oh my gosh, we're like ground zero for corruption and this problem in Diocese of Scranton. And then you talk to the other diocese and you're like, oh, wow, yours is as bad as ours. Like, we didn't think this was possible. Um, yeah. But they, um, the people in power, in charge and that have the power and the authority and the answers are the people who for the last 30, 40 years have been covering up, enabling, looking the other way. And you do, you start to analyze and you're like, why, like, is it that they're scared? Is it that they're cowards? I'm starting to realize, I don't know that they have a problem with this behavior. Like, I just don't think they see anything wrong with you know, a priest trolling for an 18 year old or something. I, I don't think they see anything wrong with a formation director an having seminaries old, no. in his room and harassing. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. But that's, I, that's my yeah. little assessment. I, I've had these conversations with some of them. An 18 year old, no, no, that they don't have a problem with. Um, an underage minor child, they do because it's, it's uh, a liability. It, well, it's it's, a, now it's, it's a criminal yeah. and a financial liability. So. I'm not sure they did in the past, though. Well, because I don't think it was a liability at that time because Maybe. it, it yeah. hadn't blown up. They, you know, they weren't paying out big. I mean, they there were payouts, but not like not like now. And sure. there wasn't the public there wasn't the public scandal because it was all it was all swept under the carpet. So sure. now what happened? Yeah, it's what happened to that priest? He did go to jail for his solicitation and um, involvement, sexual involvement with the 15-year-old. He did serve time in jail. He's not laicized. Um, there, that right now there is a civil, there's a civil suit against our diocese that's moving through because there's a now another victim that's come oh. forward. Oh no! And there, are, the victim is saying that. Um, are that the diocese knew about this behavior. Of course, the diocese is saying, oh, we were just as surprised as anybody when we got the call, he was arrested. But it, but we've subsequently found out um, because we have such an interest because we knew this priest and um, and he had reached out to me and my children that there, there were red flags, like shock, shock, right? Big surprise. There were like huge red flags before he even went into seminary. And now he's he's not in active ministry, is he? No, no, right no, 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 he's not. It's just very sad. It's sad because you have people who have been hurt by him, and um, and you have this priest that we did know, and um, and that I still do care about, that was like wasn't helped through this whole situation in his priesthood, like you know, it's not as if the the response of the church was to care about him as well. I mean, he had in his 20 or 19 years as a priest, he had four leaves of absences and 11 or 14 assignments. It, 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 there's some there's problems there and, and, and nobody seemed to care enough about him either. And he ends up in jail. So it's Quite just sad all yeah. the way around. Quite a paper trail. I, I've had conversations with uh, former priests who, who struggled in seminary, not, I haven't talked with any who, who abused, who were abusers, but who later left the priesthood. And, and um, I mean, their struggles were well known to their rectors and everyone at, at the seminary, but uh, they were pushed through. They were pushed yeah, through. Well, it's almost like it, it's similar on a smaller scale to the McCarrick situation where because we we've, we've you know in the last couple of years we've spoken with priests in our diocese and when you start going through some of the details with them about this particular case the father polish case you know they're like oh that doesn't surprise me and oh. and it's just it's the way they say it it's where it's kind of expected you know almost like you know a rite of passage in the priesthood where that's just that's just how it is. And, yeah. and that's what we're, that's what we're facing as we, we speak with, you know, different Catholics in the, in the diocese or actually throughout the country and with different priests that, that reach out to us. 
uh, that we've spoken with, it's that not necessarily we don't address that with them directly, but it's just after we get off the phone and, and, and Chris and I start talking about these situations, like, you know, it's just expected. That's just how it is. And that's a huge, huge problem. Yeah. You know? I want to give everybody, if, if you don't mind, just like a, a one minute kind of history and correct me afterwards if I'm wrong. Like a, yeah. what I found so fascinating, the Diocese of Scranton, not just because of my connection to it, but sure. just because I've, I've been in a traditional movement for a long time. So, you know, I was away from the church for most of my life. I came back in 1999 and the traditional Latin mass, Latin mass, the Tridentine mass wasn't available at that time like it is, is now. And sure. I'm from California, from the San Francisco Bay Area. I had never heard of Scranton, Pennsylvania in my whole life. And, um, but there were kind of, at that time in 99, there were some centers of the traditional movement in the church and the diocese of Scranton was definitely one of them. I mean, the fraternity of St. Peter at that time was headquartered there. And they moved later, I think in 2000 or 2001 to the diocese of, of Lincoln, Nebraska, but they, they were headquartered there. And there were other traditional groups in the diocese of Scranton. And the, the, the bishop was Bishop Timlin who had a, had a very mm -hmm. strong, good reputation as a devout, uh, you know, steadfast bishop. I, I think he, he was kind of a star in the traditional movement at that time. So I had met these priests who were from the, the, the Society of St. Pius X. They had gone to Bishop Timlin to get regularized in the church, mm -hmm. were accepted into the diocese. And they got to set up a congregation, a Latin mass congregation. And that's how I flew out to the Diocese of Scranton from San Francisco and lived there. And underneath this veneer of tradition, there was a lot of problems in that diocese. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling you anything. But and then Bishop Timlin, uh, I guess, reached retirement age of 75 and left was a bishop martino took it over from philadelphia came and, in yeah and really had to clean up that um he my, the congregation that i was involved with the society of st john was still there and still active and as far as i know there was a civil case came through they lost the diocese or they didn't well they settled the diocese settled the congregation i was involved with settled and bishop martino kicked them out to his credit and then i think yeah. bishop martino did not fulfill his term there. He, he left. No, he resigned. He resigned. Um, yeah. I know. And, I, and I, I'm sorry. He, he resigned. And then is it Bishop Bambera came in, who's the one you're dealing with, right? So, so mm -hmm. was I pretty correct here? Yes. And Bishop Martino, just from what we've, you know, because we, we're looking at this now with new eyes. So often, I think in the past, I know myself as a Catholic, you know, this, you know, one bishop will say something pro-life and I'm like, oh, he's the greatest guy ever. I trust him with my children, oh. you know, and then another one will show up in a cassing and I'm like, oh, he's fine. Let your guard down. I think I attach too much to things. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to approach things, I think, with a little um, less sentimentality for devotions and things. That being said, so I, I tried to look at Bishop Martino with fresh eyes because I had liked him when he was here and I was sad when he left. But honestly, as we've looked and we've, we've researched ourselves, Bishop Martino um, really did try to clean up the corruption. I, in like some it. ways, I, I tell my friends, like I sit here and I pray to the Lord. Lord, please bring someone to clean up the corruption in Scranton. I know you did and we kicked him out, but yeah. could you, could we have one more person? I mean, he really put himself on the line. Well, did did and, he resign? Um, was it, was it a health issue that he resigned, Bishop Martino? Technically. Yeah, that's, what was, that's what was stated. Technically. Uh, but I, but I think he was in pretty good health. Yeah. Yes. And he, he didn't seem to have health issues after he was treated poorly but, but maybe he, maybe it was the stress, he, the psychological stress of dealing with I, I think with a, there was with a lot of rot in there. It it probably got to him. A lot that. of rot, a lot of a lot of clergy were not supporting him. I bet. You know, he 
he, in a sense, cost the diocese $3 million with the Father Ali Baratori civil suit because he heard something about Father Ali Baratori, didn't let any grass grow under his feet. He was installed as bishop, called him into his office. Father Ali Baratori denied what was going on. Kristen, Kristen Martino, who, who, who is he, Father Ali Baratori? Could Father you tell Ali Baratori, sure. He was, um, I forget, not everybody knows our sorted, his, our sorted stuff in Scranton. Father director under Bishop Chimlin. He was like, I guess, a rising star. He taught, he um, ended up getting caught. I mean, he ended up getting arrested because he was in an, having a, an abusing a 16 year old boy. He had also sexually harassed seminarians, yeah. uh, other people. He was so on the radar with problems that when my bishop, Bishop Bambera, was at the time the vicar of clergy, Monsignor Bambera. He, um, he, had, he and Bishop Tinlin had him removed from the seminary as the vocations director. They didn't want him in the seminary anymore because he was such a predatory problem, yet they still had him teach at the University of Scranton and gave him an endowed chair. It's um, Bishop Koposh now was the vicar of clergy, and, uh, and while... Bish well, Father Ali Baratori was a pastor, and and it was brought to Bishop Kopash's attention that this 16-year-old boy was staying over. The housekeeper shared it. Some other people shared it, other priests, that they felt he might be being abused. So Bishop Kopash and the seminary nominated Father Ali Baratori for an endowed chair and had him teach at the University of Scranton, where he also um, sexually harassed two other students. So Bishop Martino came into this okay. and the moment he was installed, he brought Father Ali Baratori into his office and asked him what was going on. And Father Ali Baratori lied and denied. <sighs> and so Bishop Martino hired a private investigator and got the goods on him immediately over to the police and Father Ali Baratori was arrested. But the subsequent civil case against the diocese, the diocese, after two days of being in court, rolled over, said, we're going to settle. And they settled for $3 million because yeah. there was a whole lot more. They knew what was going on and um, including my current bishop. And um, so Bishop Martino did that. Then he also flew to Rome and circumvented, I guess, a, um, Bishop Timlin and a cardinal to suppress the Society of St. John. He, he took a major active role and didn't allow any pushback to stop him from suppressing, suppressing the Society of St. John that you were referencing, who also was involved in sexual abuse of children. So he, he, he really, he came in and really acted like a bishop and yeah. protected the flock and taught the flock. And he resigned it's a shame. And now Bishop Bambera is our bishop. Yep. But, but Bishop Bambera is implicated in, in all of this. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you if you read the Al Libatori case, most uh, most of the priests that are named in that are now pretty much running our diocese or in mm -hmm. key positions in our diocese. And that, that's what had set me off when you read those documents. It was mind blowing. Like the inmates are running the yeah. asylum. <laughs> this, yeah. And, but you know what, what's scary is that this situation is not unique to the Diocese of Scranton. You can no. no, Yeah. It's mirrored in almost every other diocese where uh, men who are implicated in all of these cover ups and even in the abuse itself are protected with, within the institution, shuffled around, moved around. And then nothing ever happens. Yeah. yeah it's... Well, it, it's still happening right now, like today. Uh, we just recently uh, had seen a video uh, in the last few days of a, he's the guy's called the Luzerne County Predator Catcher. And he has caught many predators over the last, I don't even know how long it's been, probably a year or so he's yeah, been doing this, May, maybe more. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, and I actually got to speak with him and he caught a, 
a member of a parish, you know, uh, in a local parish here in the Dice. He was the organist and the music director. So we see this video, it comes out online. They're made aware of it January 4th and 15 days have gone by and the diocese has said nothing to anyone. Not they to haven't parents, told the not parents the that you have a guy that's looking to meet up with a 15 year old boy at his house at midnight. I mean, the video is, is mind boggling. Uh, so, I mean, this, this, and I only bring that up just to, to share that this is going on right now that instead of the bishops, the first thing he should have done is shut this down and went out to the parents and shared this video and say, listen, even, even if that's all he could do, he could do something. You know, you have a guy that was inviting a 15 year old boy to his house at midnight and the video is, is very disturbing. Well, and the text messages and the text messages. Yeah. He was corresponding back. Done to yes. Him. Yes. But I'm just, but, but I only bring that up to say, this is going on right now under, you know, every Catholic's nose and it's happening all over the country, let alone just our diocese. And that's, that's what we're doing. We're trying to share this information with as many people that will listen. And we're relying on the, our listeners to share it with other people because no, nothing's going to change until the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, you know. But, but, but I, I, two things you said are important. I, I think the cat's been out of the bag at least since 2001 with the Boston <laughs> scandal. And, and I think a lot of, I want to ask you about this too. I mean, I think a lot of, especially the laity, I don't know, they're in a fool's paradise. I, I, I don't understand it. I, 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 think, I, I think they just don't, I think it's too upsetting. It's too shocking. I, I just don't think they want to deal with it. They don't. And if it's somebody like, and not so much the two of you, but I've gotten this. And if you talk about it, you're like, you're against the Catholic church, you're bashing priests, you know, there's so many good priests, there's so many good bishops, how can you do this? Well, and you're uh, Debbie Downer, like, they just don't <laughs> want to talk, you know, they see you coming and they're like, they go, well, go off the other way, because they, because you're going to talk about this and they you just don't want to hear it, you're Debbie Downer. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm well, Debbie I, Downer. I, I don't know, Joseph, people think we're making this stuff up like we have nothing better to do like we, we didn't we didn't want to do any of this and i'm sure you're in the same same position like we we don't want to do this every week we don't want to spend countless hours at this uh it's it's, it's not our thing uh but it's they, so important that yeah. the men that have you know continued to hide and cover up and, and shuffle around. It's so important that they're accountable for their part in it. And I'm not saying they had everything to do with it, but like in our Bishop's case, like he, we know factually from court documents that he had, he is culpable in the sexual abuse cover up. There's no doubt about it. It's a fact. And we need to know what his part was in this. He needs to be held accountable. He's our bishop for the, oh. Well, he's some, just a, you know, yeah. I think it's as a parent, I, I mean, I, I, in some ways I get it. You know, 2002 happened and we were assured that they were changing things and this was all in the past and these were old allegations and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and I was willing to buy that. And I think partly because, you know, I just, I love this faith and I just wanted to raise my kids in this faith and I wanted to just be that mom who prays the rosary with them and we celebrate saints feast days and on your baptismal day I light the candle and we have a cupcake for that too and we watch like really awesome cartoons about Our Lady Guadalupe and Our Lady of Lourdes and um and we go to mass like every day and there's a group of us and after mass everybody quick plays for a moment and it's like the sacraments the faith it's just like woven in and it's and it is so idyllic and um this upbringing that i was going to be giving my kids as a catholic and i and i get wanting that i i, I understand and thinking this this is what it is like this is the faith and this is how you raise your kids and it's realizing, having, I guess, in a sense, the scales fall from your eyes and realize, like, 
All right. Um, like, I don't know if that's how it was in the fifties, not from a Catholic family. I don't know. Um, but like, this is not going to be the Catholic faith lived out in the Catholic family today. Right. And, and coming to terms with the fact that there's a lot of pe you know, people out there in, within the leadership and within the clergy that are not on board with the faith and that don't believe key teachings in the faith and don't are not worried about doing what's legal, but not worried about doing what's moral. And, and that this idea of being close to my parish and having that be like the center of our life is, um, is not the reality at the moment. No. And, um, and it is hard to come to terms with, well, then how am I going to take this Catholic faith that is the true faith and it's the church Jesus Christ established and it, and it's, it's what matters and it's what it's about, but how am I going to take that and how are we going to live that as a family and not, and not put our head in the sand right. and live it auth really authentically and, um, and realizing it's not going to, and then accepting that it's not going to be this, oh, woo, we're Catholic, so great to be Catholic type of thing, you know. <laughs> okay, Paul, there was, there was one thing that, that you brought up that's really important that I haven't really, I mean, I've talked about it, but I haven't really, well, that's because you have personal experience in that diocese, that's why you understand it, is that I think there's a new phase in the abuse crisis. I think not because of any oversight or bravery or fortitude or anything or courage from the bishops. I think the abuse of minors, I think more or less has been clamped down on just because the bishops understand, number one, it's gonna be a public scandal. Number two, they're gonna be criminally and financially responsible if this goes on. So I think there's an incentive there it, it sounds so sad. I mean, the incentive is, you know, criminal liability, yeah. not doing what's right, that children yeah. aren't abused. Another problem that I've seen, and you brought it up in that story, is the abuse of vulnerable adults, yeah. but also sometimes not by clergy, but by the laity who are oftentimes employees of the diocese vis-a-vis -vis the parish. And, and I've had and I've I've had experience with this in my own area back here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it where oftentimes I see predation because the, the, the fact is the facts. Most of the the uh, sexual abuse that took place, even of minors, was homosexual. Um, it was it was uh, priests abusing uh, post pubescent boys. So what I've seen a lot of times is, is grooming and predation in uh, an LGBT ministry at a parish mm -hmm. where sometimes you have minors, sometimes you have vulnerable adults there that for whatever reason are seeking out, you know, care and compassion in the Catholic church. And, and there's predation oftentimes not by the priest or the clergy, but by the, the laity. And then you talked about that. There's a situation there. And I think, that is another phase in the abuse crisis where it's not so much clergy, but it's, it's the laity or lay ministers in, in the church. So that was important. What yeah, and our, our bishop goes out of his way anytime they talk about the abuse scandal, out of his way to talk about minors. It was a you know, it wasn't a minor. It wasn't a minor. So if there's anything that happened that wasn't a minor, it's okay with them. They're fine with that. They have no issue there. And we're, we're missing the fact because they keep, they keep saying that he wasn't a minor. He wasn't a minor. He wasn't a minor. We're missing the fact that this, this shouldn't be going on regard. It's still sexual harassment. It's still immoral. It has no place in the church and, and nobody seems to care enough to confront these guys and hold them accountable for that aspect of it. Nobody does. But if it's a minor, which, which obviously that's horrifying, but, but 
there's a whole part of this, which is probably the majority of it, that nobody's addressing. And the, and the bishops don't seem to have a problem with it. I mean, you know. And, and predators are smart. They can switch up their MOs really fast. And I sure. think they've realized that they can no longer abuse minors as easily as they used to be able to. So I sure. think they've switched up and I've seen it. And I think they are preying on vulnerable adults. Another problem that you guys have in the Diocese of Scranton is the University of Scranton, which is mm. Jesuit. And I've seen it wherever <laughs> their Jesuits have a strong presence. It, it's, it's a nightmare. It's, it's, it's like hell opens up. And, and really, the, and I've been to Scranton, and the downtown area of Scranton is kind of taken over by the University of Scranton, yeah, which, yeah. Which, is Je- yeah. which is Jesuit. And uh, James Martin spoke there. I remember uh, Scranton came back on my radar again. James Martin yeah. spoke there, and I think there was a real groundswell of the faithful lady who, who didn't yeah. want him to speak. And then Bishop Bambera came to the rescue and said, no, 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 this man should, of course, should yes. speak and, 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 and groom people and, uh, you know. Speaking of the University of Scranton, uh, and you have to correct me on the facts here in case okay. I don't get them right, Kristen always does. Um, when Bishop Bambera was actually on the board of the University of Scranton, right. And knew about the predatory behavior of Father Al Libatori and allowed him to receive an endowed chair, which at the time he wasn't bishop, obviously. He was the when, when he, was, he on, was on the seminary board and he was um what was he, the vicar of clergy? He wasn't at the, the time? vicar of clergy when he was on the board of Scranton, but he was Monsignor Bambera on the Bambera. board. Okay. He was on the board of trustees. And he allowed him to continue to teach. He because he had to also approve of this endowed chair that Father Al Libatori had. He had already at this point sent the note to Bishop Timlin, so he With was already uh, we you know well, we, he already it's, had it's, him not on the seminary. Group. He didn't want him in the seminary. Yeah, and it's documented that he already knew of his behavior of his. I think it was in Bishop Bambera's words the grave immoral behavior that that he had let uh, Bishop the current Bishop at the time Bishop Timlin know. And he allowed this guy, and subsequently he went on to abuse another person, another uh, minor. Yeah, One of them was a minor, right? Minor, At, and then two students on the grounds of the University of Scranton. So we actually wrote the University of Scranton. We wrote the president. We wrote the board of trustees. Nothing, because we wanted to find out, like, like where the was the problem? Not, like, yeah, when he was on the board, he didn't tell you. Like, aren't you a little upset? Like, what, yeah. how can you be on a board? Know this is going on. And um, and have this person teaching, and you don't give anybody a heads up. Like, what's your job on the board if you're not going to do that? One thing I wanted to just say, because it just popped into my mind, I guess, is, you know, I don't know. I think we have to take a step back and reflect a little, and remember, sometimes people don't want to hear ones over the age of 18. It's easy to dismiss. It's well, why would you let this happen to you and everything like that? Except I think we as Catholics all have to take a step back for a moment and realize and be honest with ourselves that when someone is a priest or even somebody who's like in ministry leading, you have a tendency to trust Yes. And to doubt yourself when they do things. I mean, I'm a pretty fiery personality. Paul can tell you if somebody says something to me, I, I might give it back to him. You know, I'm not, not going to take a lot. Um, and yet I can't tell you how many priests and people in ministry have said things to me that are horrible and done things to me that are horrible that I kind of took as, oh, oh, maybe I'm not being Christian. Oh, yeah, like, like it took me a while to realize like, oh, no, that really wasn't okay. Um, this happened to me in college and it's happened to me in my real adult life. So I, I think we have to take a step back and remember that. Like, I think we all tolerate and doubt our natural feelings sometimes because you're with someone who's supposed to be the person of Christ or exactly. someone who's supposed to be mentoring you spiritually. Yep. Thank you for saying that because I mean, I, I, I don't want to get into my story, but I was sexually abused by a priest when I was 16. But then later when I was in my early twenties and I, this is after I'd come out as a gay man and I had some gay street cred, I should have known better. I got involved with another priest because he knew I was vulnerable and he, and he groomed me and he, 
and th the thing that's very nefarious about what happens in specifically in Catholicism in terms of predation, which is different because there's other, there's sexual predators all over. But what's, what's kind of unique in Catholicism is they do use God in terms of their grooming process. And it's, it's, it's very sick and it's very, very evil. It, it's ratchet. I mean, it's all evil, but it's almost ratcheted up to another level of evil because Elizabeth York called it soul murder. It's just, it really devastates people. I, I, and, you know. and that's something Joseph that, um, Dr. Janet Smith, we, we had her on one of the shows and she had pointed out something uh, that that parallels kind of what we're talking about because when the bishops speak about the abuse crisis, they speak about it with, with no emotion. They're not angry. They're not enraged. People's no. lives have been destroyed. They're like lawyers. Right. And, and they're, they're like reading it off a, like a press release. Oh, we're so sorry and blah, blah. There, there should be outrage. They should be doing, they should take that Bishop Bambara, if he happens to see this, take that $60 million endowment and get to the bottom of this and make sure it is not something that happens in the church anymore. I mean, anywhere for that matter, but, but we're, we're discussing specifically towards the church. Put some, put some real money behind this, hire the investigators, find out who was a part of it, who enabled these predators. And, and, and I think one of the reasons they don't because his staff would be gone, <laughs> you know. They'd have to start ordaining people right out of the seminary. Yeah. So to be bishop. It's very frustrating. It, it, it's so frustrating, but uh, you know, we, we don't, they're, they're not being fathers. They're not behaving like fathers. No father would, would allow this to happen and do nothing about it. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're doing nothing about it. They don't, they don't know anything. They don't know the first thing about being, of course, they don't know anything about being a biological father, but I don't think they know how to be a spiritual father either, because I've had mm -hmm. conversations with bishops just as a concerned Catholic and as an abuse survivor, I've never received any kind of compassion or apology. None of it. I don't care what they do publicly when the cameras are rolling, but what they do privately, I have to say, and it's still this way, if bishops have this mentality, and even if you go, and even if you approach them with uh, a, a faithful heart and they, they view you as the enemy, that and I don't know why they can't turn that off and it's 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 pretty bad. But I want to ask you too, because kind of the point I wanted to talk to you guys today. Well, one of them was that being a Catholic family in the Catholic Church at a time of crisis. Because I got to say, in '99, when I came back to the faith, I don't know. I've, I've written about it a hundred times. I, and I still can't wrap my mind about my, my mind around it. But I have to say, when I came back to the faith, I experienced pretty much everything that I had left behind as a teenager, um, predation, grooming, abuse. It was, it was all still there. And I experienced it in the first probably couple of weeks. Mm. And I was really, and I have to say, not all the priests I encountered were sick and evil there were some really great ones i mean that's why i stayed they were difficult to find they weren't like on my trajectory typically where somebody like me who's maybe gay and you're kind of shuffled into a gay ministry that's where you go no they were kind of on the periphery and it was often in the more traditional rigid you know out of the way parishes and in the tlm movement and one of the things that I have to say that kept me in the church at that time were, were Catholic families a lot like you, because, and I know you guys don't go to the traditional Latin mass, but, but um, I, I went to the TLM and there were just a lot of good, wholesome, that's such a trite word, but, but just wonderful Catholic families, a dad, a mom, lots of kids. I mean, I'd never experienced that growing up in the 70s and the 80s in, Bay Area, in the Bay Area. You know, men were absent from church for the most part. You know, the, the, the sanctuary was full of a lot of women, 
you know, lectors, ministers, acolytes, serve, you know, everything. And it's just, it, it was a big, it was a big turnoff. But when I, when I went to the traditional side of Catholicism at that time, you know, it was a revelation that there were families and, and they seemed to be so joyful and happy and healthy. And it, it was one of the things I have to say that kept me, that kept me in. And this was before this, the scandal, but it's sort of like people found refuge in more traditional parishes. Now, how have you guys been able to cope, you know, in, in your own, in your own diocese? Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely difficult. Um, I, I guess be, because I haven't always been, you know, on fire or, you know, really engaged in my faith. This is, this is a new thing for me. This has only been in the last, like, we'll call it 10 years. And it, it's, but so you were born, that, and you were born and raised Paul Catholic. Yes. Yes. I absolutely. I graduated Christian, from you're, CCB. You're and, I'm the convert. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the convert. Confirmation graduated and moved on. Did you ever drift away in like in the seventies and the eighties? Cause we're about the same age, you know, you kind of, did you ever drift away and not practice or, you know? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I really didn't even understand what it meant to be a Catholic till literally about 10 years ago. I oh, wanted no, I to, I, I know the family you're talking about because <laughs> I homeschooled. I, I can't tell you like um, when Paul was not in his faith, really, he hadn't reverted back. I wanted to be that traditional Latin mass family. Like that was my prayer. Like, oh, I just wanted to, you know, like, I mean, I personally always veil at mass. I go to a Novus Ordo mass. I just, always, I always veil though. I always veil. Um, it's my personal devotion, um, way to show the, you know, in a physical way, the presence that I'm in the presence, the true presence of Christ. And, um, I, so I, I guess I had more traditional leanings mm. and I always wanted to, I mean, I think I took you to one or two Latin masses. I think I took you to Latin mass. And then for mother's day, I, I had you take me to a Byzantine as well, a Byzantine. Cause I love that liturgy, but right. I, um, I, I would have loved to have been that family that was at the Latin mass or a Byzantine mass and part of that community. But um, we were at a point where that wasn't happening, and I felt it was more important for us to just be together as a family at Mass on Sunday, whether you were really believing or not. Well, we needed I, to gotta, worship together. I, I was a big obstacle to the faith in our family and, until we're talking about this. Like it was, it, was, it was literally a cultural thing or just a habitual thing. It's just something you did. You checked the box. Uh, and, and I was arrogant. And, you know, you went through a Protestant phase. <laughs> Can I tell the quick story? Can I just, okay, because it's funny. All it's right. funny. At one point, Paul's <laughs> going to, um, you went to like a Bible study, this Protestant Bible study. And you were, I mean, you were starting to come back and stuff. And I'm like, you know, trying to just pray and fast and um, do things like that. And our oldest daughter actually prayed a rosary every night for her dad to come to the faith. And, um, you were going, and I remember we had this church next to us that was a Protestant church, and they had asked <laughs> if the kids could sing this summer. They, we used it for the recital, and they said, if you use it for their little piano recital, can they come and sing in one of our services? And I said, okay. So Paul said, I said, but, you know, obviously we're going to Mass first on Sunday because we're going to receive Jesus and be present at the Mass, and then we can go sing for these people. But so my husband says we go to mass, which, you know, is like jam packed with scripture left and right. And then as we're driving to the church, the Protestant church, Paul says, all right, kids, we're going to this Protestant church and they're, you know, Protestants real Bible based. So now you're going to really hear a lot of scripture in the Bible. <laughs> and I'm looking out the window going, Lord, how much longer do I have to take this? <laughs> and I'm trying to be quiet. And we get in there and it was like it was a, like an hour and a half long and the kids did a couple songs that were, you know, Catholic. Ha -ha. And, um, they, it, they, I mean, literally it was like what a half a verse 
yeah. is all you heard the whole service. It was like a Methodist church. And I'm not trying to be mean. I mean, that's their, their way they're worshiping. They have a piece of the pie. But um, I, and he walks out, he's like, there was like no scripture there. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> please awaken him, awaken him now. Um, so you kind of went through that. You were searching. And um, but then you came back with a vengeance. Yeah. yeah. No, the, it's even, the, the, par ahead. the parish you belong to, is it more liturgically traditional? You know, Nova Sordo? No. It's, it's, no, it's not, it's, is it a guitar? Is it folk, the folk guitar no, man? No, no, no there's no, some, no, no. yeah, yeah. We actually, that's what we have. Beautiful. We have an organ. Yes, and we have. We have an organ. Yeah. Oh, okay, wow. Um, we, the, the tabernacle's been moved to the middle, so. Oh, in, awesome. In the past couple years. So, I it, and we, we, we really, we're very blessed the parish we're in because we have a, um, we probably have one of the top priests in the whole diocese. We were going to rank. Right. Yeah, he's way up. He's up there. <laughs> Not that we're going to rank, but um, yeah, he's great. But but it's tough because uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced uh, a mass with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Yes. Uh, so we would go to the, the Bronx and, yes. do, and do the vigil mass up there. And it is just it's a it's a little slice of heaven mm. and it's so reverent and so beautiful and it's it is difficult. and it's a nova sordo oh it's, it's a just nova sordo actually too. the way too. the nova sordo is supposed to be but when you're when you're surrounded by a group of people with like-minded that that believe and have also that intellectual understanding of what you're doing it's it's powerful it's really powerful and that's and that's obviously what you get in the traditional latin mass on a regular basis and now, we also go to the ordinariate um yeah yeah. Some, that and that's that's you know, been a blessing beautiful right. and interestingly that you know that one of the teenagers in the house is always wanting to go to the ordinary oh that's interesting now yeah. the past now the pastor at your parish do do people gravitate around him i mean does he draw because sometimes i've noticed here is if you have a more not necessarily traditional but a more faithful priest a lot of people will just start gravitating around them more families more I, younger. I would think he's the reason that a lot of people have stayed yep. in the church i don't know that parish. a lot of families come around you know what we're in like this this we're going into this what demographical winter and there just aren't the families there, there just aren't the families and in scranton in particular in this area older it, it you really yeah. have um i, I mean what Eight years ago, I had like 40 kids in vacation Bible school and I used to run it. Oh. The last couple of years, you have like five. I mean, I was turning people away eight years ago. That was like the final little like peak. And it's just, it's, it's sliding down big time. Yeah. And I know that when I was up there in the Poconos at, at, at um, the community I was with, we were drawing people that again, the Latin mass wasn't available. We were drawing people from New Jersey Sure. from upstate oh, New York, from New York City. I mean, it was just crazy. And they were they were typically younger Catholic couples, you know, starting a, a family. And I have to say, I think, I think the Catholic Church is coming to that remnant point. And it looks like, you know, in traditionalism is where it's going to survive. I, I just yeah, I think so. Too. I think I think you're right. I think the, the Latin Mass and I think um you know, like Diocese of Arlington, sometimes if you go there, when we go there for mass, or, or one of our kids lives down there, you always have this, like, again, it's Nova Sordo, but it's like how it's supposed to be, how it was supposed to be done, yep. not a hoot nanny. And, um, <laughs> and then the ordinary, again, their, their, their liturgy is beautiful. So um, I think there's, I, I think people are gravitating towards that. You're right. I think they're going to kind of cluster around that. And then I think also, priests clustering around priests that are that that frankly believe like yeah. believe in the real presence believe in the culture of life and um, the, they, and those priests that remain faithful i i know need the support of the laity too yes. mm -hmm. because i don't think a lot of times they have it from their bishop so i think that means a lot that they know that somebody has their back yeah. well, I don't think the laity has any idea uh, the tough spot I the do. good priests are in right now. I do. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's rough. But the other thing you have, you have faithful people 
who who love the Lord, they love the mass, they, they're prayerful, that if, if you, um, because I, I myself, I'm, I'm always learning that they don't really understand the abuses taking place in their liturgy. And they think certain things are, are, are wonderful. You know, I, and I, I'll just use myself in his example, like the kiss of peace. You know, I, oh, my boy. daughter explained to us what the kiss of peace means. And I'm like, oh, maybe we shouldn't slather all over each other during it. I don't know. I'm trying to have a nice moment with the family, you know, and it's a nice healing moment because I've usually yelled at everybody to get out the door. So I'm like, I love you. Peace be with you. But I didn't realize like what it really is supposed to is that representation, like we're all together, the yeah. church triumphant, the church suffering. And um, the when I go, and yeah, when I go else. to the, no, yeah, when I go to the Novus Ordo here in California, well, now it's kind of crazy, but one of the great things about COVID was that they, they quit communion on the communion via the cup. So not under both species. And then they, they got rid of the, the kiss piece, which yeah. I was just thrilled about, you know, <laughs> so father isn't, you know, meandering oh, I know. the parish you know, shaking right. hand, shaking right. hand. And father also usually now stays on the altar to give the homily. Oh, God bless. He's you. not working it anymore because of COVID. That's kind of nice. I <laughs> forgot that. <laughs> no, but now you did homeschool your, your children though, which is usually associated more with the traditional Latin mass movement. Now, did you, did you homeschool your kids? It was it just a practical or was it because you didn't like the parochial schools around there or? What, what was there? Well, I, I mean, I was totally against it at first. I have to tell you that. Wow. And basically when, when Chris asked, or when we started talking about homeschooling, I'm like, I, I do not want my kids to be homeschooled. And my, my thought was instead of trying to homeschool, why don't we go try to fix Okay. The, the, we why don't we go try to fix well, you or, right okay, why don't you, you wanted it all on that's me that's right why don't you go try <laughs> to fix the system so it's not just for our kids let's make it better for everybody and we were shocked once again that they weren't interested <laughs> they they wanted nothing to do with it that their curriculum could be better or or yeah, because yeah, it was really, I mean, at this point, we were in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia at the yeah. time, and our daughter was in the Catholic parish yeah, yeah. school, and I was like, ooh, you know, and I guess we both thought, I, I know I was public school educated, but I thought, oh, you know, the Catholic schools are supposed to be so great, so, so great, you know, and then I'm like, ooh, the emperor has no clothes, my education was actually better in a public school, <laughs> right, um, right. so, and then, there, and but I was willing to, like, kind of forgo some certain things if the faith was like vibrant and alive and it really wasn't so I tried to I met with the secretary of education for the archdiocese of Philadelphia I got a meeting with him wow. I did a whole proposal everything huge thing and it was like yeah thanks and then I met with the principal of the school and she was like well you have to talk to the pastor but she wasn't interested I talked to the pastor of my parish and he was not interested um so I walked over to the Adoration Chapel and I sat down at that chapel and I said, all right, Lord, I know you want me to homeschool. Fine, I'll homeschool, but you have to, um, you have to convince my husband because there's really nothing I can do right now about this. And literally, I'm not kidding. Within a month, he sits down one night and he's like, all right, convince me why we should homeschool our kids. I think we might have to. And we kind of started homeschooling. I did it for both reasons, academic and, um, and for the faith, there was a, there was an education I wanted them to have that I knew was out there. And um, we started homeschooling. And even when you weren't solid with your Catholic faith, you were always like solid with the homeschooling. Like you yeah, were I mean, really, it, tur it turned out to be fantastic for us. But, yeah. Uh, it's always yeah. been a great. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of Catholic parochial education. I mean, I went through 12 years of Catholic school, albeit it was in the 70s and 80s, and it was in San Francisco. But but I hear stories from Catholic parents all the time. You know, my kids' Catholic school has a gay straight alliance. Um, you know, the, one of the teachers had a big celebration when one of the students came out 
as as gay. Oh my gosh! I mean, it, a lot of times it, it revolves around the gay issue, and um, it. I, at least if kids are in a public school, I think they're gonna, to a certain degree, they're gonna in, be indoctrinated into all this leftist ideology, but at least in the public school, it's not gonna be attached to religion or to God, which, well, is, what they, that, which is what they do in Catholic. The, it's yeah. not deception the same way. Yeah, that, and that's the problem is that you, you no, no, nobody expects to get a, you know, to, to grow their faith in a public school. But it, when you when you I think what's worse though when it when you call yourself a Catholic school and you behave to the contrary, it's 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 ten times worse than sending them to a public school because the example that you're getting of what it means to be Catholic is not there. If anything, it's it's it goes contrary to the Catholic faith. A lot of the things that are going on in these schools, and I I would. I would definitely argue that 50 or 100 years from now, we're going to look back as, as a church and see that one of the single largest uh, contributors to the loss of the faith in this country is Catholic education. Amen. I think we're going to see that very clearly 50 or 100 years from now. That, also, that was where that's where the problems it also fos I found not having been Catholic educated public school educated and then I went to Villanova which was a wow. Catholic school oh, um, not at all yeah oh it was mm, yeah yeah four years of a long fight I mean I learned I learned my faith because you'd be like say something I'd be like wait wait I is that really what the church teaches it doesn't sound right and then I'd have to go find what the church teaches and then raise my hand again the next time and go you know you said this but you left out this um but I, I think it also fosters elitism like that's what I've found people think that they're somehow better educated because they're in a Catholic school, especially the schools that are private, like run by orders. There's a huge elitism that goes on. And um, and I and you just think to yourself, like, I mean, this is not of the gospel. No. It's just not of the gospel. And a lot of these schools, I'm not sure would accept Jesus, you know, in their school. So I they're 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 very there's just an elitism there. And, um, and, and I didn't certainly didn't want that for my kids. And I don't think you have that in a public school the same way. No. And, and the worst of the worst are the, are the Jesuit, the Jesuit universities. And, and thinking that they're uber intellectual Catholics, like that's the other part that kills me is they think, I mean, how many times have I heard from, Oh, I went to, you know, I went in Philadelphia. I went to St. Joe's Prep. I know my, I'm like, I could, you know, I, I could right now machete you with a couple things, get you to your knees and show you how you don't know your faith. Like you didn't learn it. There was a disservice. I mean, you went to a private Catholic school and felt yeah, yeah. Waste of it took my, me waste. till 10 years ago to figure it out. Oh, God, forgive. Waste of my mom and dad's money after 12 years of, of Catholic, you know, uh, 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 grammar and secondary school. I was, I was, uh, I didn't believe in God. Um, I'd been abused and I was gay. So it's, it's, it's a nightmare. I just thank God that, that more and more. And again, it's, I think it's related to the traditional movement that more and more Catholic parents are homeschooling, but then all, there's also this trend of sort of little traditional Catholic schools mm -hmm. that kind of pop up, you know, which is really cool. But the, the one thing I always go back to the traditional movement, even if you're at a Nova Soto parish, whatever, um, and you find a good priest that, and you brought this up and I, I want to bounce right back, Paul, that priest is still, he is still there by the good graces of the bishop. Yes. And that's why corruption in the hierarchy is so important. He can, rem he can transfer that priest. Uh, he could close down your Latin mass if he wants to, unless you're SSPX or Sede Vacantes, or uh, he could laicize that priest. Now I, I've had priests contact me and, and, and say that they live in, I'm not being, I'm not being dramatic. They live in fear of their bishops. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's no doubt about that. No doubt. Yeah, and, and, and they, psychologically, they a, that's yeah. psychologically that is not. It's not good. And and so many of these priests, uh, um, 
you know, when, when I've talked with them, it's, it's not they're conflicted. They, they want to stay a priest because they feel like they're doing so, so much good, you know, just in, in their little corner of the world, wherever it is. And, and they've, they've dedicated so much time, their, their whole lives to this. It's not like a career where if they get sacked at their job, they can just pick up and go somewhere else and get another job. It, you know, if the bishop pulls the plug, it's over for them. So, I mean, it, they're, they're scared. They're scared. And I think the, the price they've had to pay in order to keep their vocation is they've had to keep silent. We said um, when we started the podcast, we were talking about trying to not, um, trying to just have great charity and understanding with priests. Cause I, I feel like it's like a bad marriage Yep. Like they've been in a bad marriage, really bad marriage. And yet it still is a valid marriage. It's a sacramental marriage. It can still have good coming from it. And I feel like that's kind of like the priest, these priests right now, they're in a really bad marriage and, and they're doing the best they can. And yeah. you can look at them sometimes and go, what are you doing? But it's, you know, they're in a bad marriage and they're just trying to live faithfully. And the three, and the three topics they can't talk about in their inter interconnected homosexuality the sex abuse crisis and corruption in the hierarchy they can't talk about them yep. Yep. They oh, can't. we've literally had priests reach out to us just to say thank you for what we're doing you know and and that's a that's a tough one because you know all, all we want is to to hold the leaders in the church accountable for their behavior i mean that's it that's what we want. The, 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 the problem that I've come up against is that the, the church is not a democracy. It, so you can't, you can't vote these people out of office. Uh, you, you, can, you can vote with your pocketbook and not support them. But really, there is absolutely no way to remove a corrupt bishop. There, there's just no way to do it. You can scream, yell, holler. Right, I, I, I sympathize with a lot of Catholics on like Facebook or Twitter when these petitions, these online petitions go around and, you know, we've got 10,000, we've got 20,000. Uh -huh. I'm sorry to say it doesn't do, it doesn't yeah. do anything. It, it doesn't yeah. do it. What about the book? Hmm? What did Peter Damien do? You're reading the book. Oh, I just started a book. Uh, a, a good priest friend of ours just... Um, shared with me this book called Gomorrah St. Oh, Peter yeah. Damien. I, read it. I I am amazed Book of Gomorrah at what was going on yes. around the year 1000. It yes. was and it's amazing how this one I guess he bishop who turned became a bishop. I'm I'm only about a quarter done the book. Uh but it it and it I guess it's encouraging though that you know he he wrote letters to the the, the Pope and he just hammered them on this is what the faith is you you know this is what we you know we need to be doing as a church and what you need to be doing as a Pope and it was mind-blowing what was going on back then though I mean it, it really it kind of helped me to see that okay this isn't the first time this has happened you know no. we've been through that we've been here before no I I smile because the, the, I reference a book of Gomorrah in, in my book, but then um, I've, I've also done a lot of writing and, I, and I've referenced it. I referenced it too. I have to say the difference, I think, between what's going on now and then is I, 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 I would say there was definitely sex abuse going on, homosexual, but it, it, I think it tended to be more localized. I don't think it was the corruption was as institutionalized sure, as sure. as it as it is now. I mean, it's it's it where you would have a particular monastery with a problem, or a particular religious order with a problem. But now I have to say it's it's institutionalized within the Catholic Church. It's it's much sure. bigger. It's much wider. It's much more in, entrenched. Well, this way it's up to the individual, you know, the, the, the Catholics in their own diocese are the only people that that can really 
affect anything to change within the diocese. Like, I, I don't think it's going to happen on the scale. Like s somebody, uh, even some of the big media outlets that are pounding the drum, which is fantastic. And, and we're very uh, thankful that they're doing that. And just like what you're doing, Joseph, it's, it's, it's very encouraging for us. But it really is going to be up to the individual Catholics in their own diocese. Nobody's coming to help you. Like you, you have to share this information, do your research, you know, get into conversations with people within the diocese and, and do what you can to affect change in your own diocese. Cause it's, it's nobody's, nobody's yeah, coming to help. I know. Paul, the thing is, is there's so much apathy and so much indifference in the Catholic church. I mean, I'm looking here oh, I, in the Bay I area agree. too. I mean, you have a lot of, I mean, you had 20% of Catholics who were going weekly to mass. Here they say now it's down to like between five and 10. And I mean, a lot of those people are little old ladies. They just, they don't, they don't know what's going on. They don't, they don't have social media. It, it's hard. It's hard to get people interested. And then even in a diocese where you do get people, you know, concerned about it, it's, especially with, with certain bishops, they have their favorites and they say not, it can't be this bishop. It, it can't be that bishop. They can't get it through their head that, that it's an institutional problem. So. Well, we just talked about, um, I think it was on the last podcast, actually, we did. We talked about, I know there aren't a lot of Catholics going to mass faithfully right now, right. but there are Catholics in the American church there are people that have money and that are prominent. Yeah. And then there are those who um, are prominent academics and write and go on the circuit. Mm -hmm. And I really do think it is incumbent upon that lady mm -hmm. to, um, to affect some change. You know, the, these prominent Catholics that have all this money that do like Napa Institute, Papal Foundation, all these different lay goddess, all of those, they're, they're, like they could fund, they Kristen, could fund and do their own investigations. Kristen, they're insiders. They're insiders. I, I've been, I've been to some of those, those, I don't know what you call conferences. They don't challenge the bishops. They don't do it. They just don't, don't they, they just don't do it. I mean, somebody like James Martin is low hanging fruit. Sorry for the, the, the bad, you know, yeah. an yeah. analogy, but they're not going to criticize the Corbion. They're not even going to criticize the Dolan. I don't even want them to criticize anymore. You know what I want them to do? I'm real specific. I want them to take their money and their influence, and I want them to start investigating. I want them to ask questions. They know priests. They know this. They know that. They need to start connecting the dots, and they need to start bringing yeah. the truth to light. I think it's incumbent upon them to do it. Yeah, they won't do it. I, and and um, <laughs> I mean, I you know, <laughs> we're sitting here going paycheck to paycheck, week to week. We haven't been blessed with what they've been blessed with. I but if I, I ever get blessed with what they have, I am going to be investigating. <laughs> Christian, they won't do it because I think, I, think, um, I think it would be too difficult for them because it would expose how corrupt the church really is. And I have to say, when, when I ever you know, critique or criticize anything that a bishop or a does, or, or, or about the, or specific, I should just say, when I, when I say anything about the Catholic Church as an institution, I get this robotic answer, you know, the, it's the Bride of Christ, it's the Bride of Christ, it's the Bride of Christ, it's the Bride of Christ. I, I, I get it, but there's some really big problems, and repeating that isn't going to make it go away. Well, know what they don't understand with it's the bride of Christ is the bride of Christ. Exactly. We get it. Would you be doing what you're doing if it wasn't the bride of Christ? If this were the Lions Club down the street, we wouldn't be doing this be it's because it's the bride of Christ. Right. I wouldn't be calling out Bishop Ambera if he wasn't a bishop and a successor to the apostles, you know, the apostles. If he was the grand poobah at the lodge. I wouldn't care. It's because of that. Not to mention we have a duty to do this. It, we're, we're supposed to do this. We have to do this. We're, we're seeing criminal behavior. 
We're seeing immor immoral behavior. We are, it's our duty as Catholics to call this out. And, and you would think if there was nothing to hide, they'd have this discussion. They do it in public. We could have this discussion with the leaders in the church. And it just shows me that there is something to hide because they keep ducking the responsibility of getting to the bottom. Like, I, I, I don't know, how survivors are treated is horrifying. It's horrifying how they're treated. And, and the bishops have a duty to these survivors that their faith was the reason they were allowed, in most cases, I think, I think I'm safe to say that, but, but their faith or their family's faith was the reason they were able to be abused. So the bishops, it's their duty they have to do this, and we have to hold them accountable to that. Well, it's like we always, I always, it's, it's, you know, when they always talk about, like, if someone's in the jungle, and we're supposed to send money for the missions because they're sitting in a jungle, and they don't have access to the sacraments. They don't have the gospel. They don't have access to the sacraments. But what's happened specifically with, like, survivors, for instance, is you have people who have been profoundly hurt, and because of the way this church has responded, the bishops, priests, and also the laity, we need it on us as well. Yep. You have to set up a situation that's like that jungle where people who are survivors don't get to have access to the sacraments. Like we're supposed to change that. We're not the same way we can't go through life not caring about the missions. We can't not care about the corruption and the survivors. And, uh, and again, that's why as and people who have a strong voice and who have the money and who can do things behind the scenes, yep. it is incumbent upon us to do what we can and root this out so that, so that people can actually come back to the sacraments. I mean, they're supposed to mean something, right? Yes, correct. The, the, the only thing that I, I've kept you too long too. The, the, the one thing that I, I worry about too is that the apparatus for abuse is still in place within the church. Yeah, that has absolutely. been dismantled. Absolutely. absolutely. There, I think there's a lot of dismantling that has to happen, but it has to, because I'll, we'll just say as parents, I have seven children that we baptized as Catholics. Wow. I want them to get to heaven and I want them to have a vibrant, joyful faith. And if we keep going the way we're going, keeping people from the sacraments, if we keep turning a blind eye to the corruption, if we keep our head in the sand, and if we try to live this like fake re Facebook reality Catholicism, mm -hmm. I, my children aren't going to practice their faith and it's not going to in any real meaningful way. And, and I don't see anybody else's. And, and yeah. I think it's, it's important as parents to show, I guess, also that this is something worth fighting for. It's important. One other topic real quick that I wanted to address with you, because I notice it on social media a lot of times is too, is especially among traditional Catholics, I see kind of this tendency where they do kind of get in an enclave and they kind of feel like they're kind of protected from whatever else is going on in the wider church. You know, they've got a good priest. You know, he offers a great mass and the sacraments, you know, we're okay. I, you know, and I don't think that's, that's true. I don't think you can cut yourself off from what's going on in the rest of the church. And this little remnant here will survive. Because like I said, a bishop could pull a plug on you really quick. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's a tough one because I, I, I think there could become a time when that becomes necessary. Yeah. Uh, like to, uh, to isolate, but I think, you know, as long as, you know, we still live in the U.S., we're still free to, to speak how we want to speak. I, I think it's important to engage. And I think that's what we're called to do anyway, too. We're supposed to take, you know, live our faith and engage. And I don't mean by, you know, being preachy or whatever, uh, you know, just by living the faith the best you can in, in the community or, you know, whether it's at your job or, or, or wherever. And, and Plus not, not by what you're saying. But having I, mean, just, kids, just I don't know, maybe it's just our family, <laughs> but trying to um, have like a safe little enclave 
works for a while, you right. know? Um, and I think, I think you can do it probably till they're about 18 if right. you really clamp down. Um, but if, if maybe not in healthy ways clamping, but you can do it. I think um, when they get into college and then even if they don't go to college and they, you know, at some point when they leave your home yeah. and have to move on um, there, you know, it's, it's, it's a little harder for them to, or it's a little harder to keep them in that little bubble and that enclave and, and the world comes, the world comes crashing down. And, um, and at least that's been our, exp- our experience with, you know, our kids, some, <laughs> it's, it's some of them stand up to it. Some of them get caught up a little. And um, although I don't know with us as parents, I don't know what we were thinking, but, you know, <laughs> but they, they might, you know, we were a little shocked when they made mistakes. I don't know how that, you know, why we were shocked because we made them too. So, um, and we still sometimes do, but I mean, the world is, there's, it, it's going to be really hard to insulate your kids from the world, which is why I, I think it's so important to try to have it go deep. And, um, and then when, when times are tough, and we've had this a couple of times now when something has blown up in the family. Um, we, you know, we, I remember one instance with one kid, something blew up and together as a family, we don't always pray a family rosary, but I remember we did like for 54 days in a row, mm-hmm. we prayed as a family, that rosary. Um, last COVID awesome. quarantine, we prayed, you know, we prayed a daily rosary as a family all through the COVID um quarantine until about june the word we're not good about keeping that up. no we don't we, keep it up we uh, but it, we, we break that unfortunately time, it seems to be crisis and then suddenly we huddle and we need to get a good like six weeks every night together as a family that rosary comes out so oh, word. you know and I, and there are times of crisis when someone you know can you pray this novena with me mom or i want you know who can you find someone we have to pray to this is happening so um we're not always good about consistency that's for sure <laughs> But I think they, at least I've seen so far with our older ones, when, when things blow up or they fall flat on their face because they didn't listen to me and stick with the faith like they should have. Um, I'll be, I'll, I'll be bold. I, I'll be bold. I think your kids are going to be okay because you're living it. With, with my parents are super important because I think my parents and I, we kind of had a parallel trajectory for a while. I mean, my upbringing in Catholicism was pretty indifferent here in the Bay Area. But, and when I was gay, my mom and dad mm, kind of had drifted away. And, um, but when things got really dark in my life, it's interesting. My mom and dad had a conversion or a reconversion or whatever you want to call it. And they became very devout. And one of the reasons why I think my life didn't end there when it could have is I think the example of my mom and dad, you know, and, and mom, and, and, you know, it's, it's so important, you know, a, a, a father and a mother because they balance each other so well. My dad is Italian. My dad was very strong. You know, what's right is right. What's wrong is wrong, you know, black and white, there's no gray. And my mother was, as moms are, is, was a little more loving, a little more compassionate, but that combination, you know, works so good. <laughs> it did. Oh, Even, that's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta say, I'm very thankful for the two of you be, because I, I think if there's any hope for the Catholic Church, I think it's the Catholic family. And I think the two of you are important because you can't take anything for granted. You, you can't take your bishop for granted. You, you can't take a, the, the parish or the, or the priest. I think you have to be involved in, I think you have to, you ha- you have to be the main ones uh, to care and, 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 you know, oversee your children. I don't, I don't, cause I think in, in my parents' generation, because I think they were in the fifties and sixties, I think they kind of felt we're sending the kids to Catholic school. That part of our life is kind of done. They'll be yeah, educated yeah. and they'll be taken care yeah. of. And that's, that's gone. That's gone. And, and I think if anybody is going to keep, like you said, the, the bishops and the hierarchy accountable, it's going to be families like like the two of you. Sure. 
Thanks. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Paul. No, thank you for having thank us. Thank you. That it was, was our pleasure. Yeah. And thank, thank you for joining us, joining us on our podcast. We really I know. enjoyed that too. I, I feel I feel like I kind of know you guys. So but I learned I learned new things too <laughs> no, we, with this discussion. So it it's awesome. Thank you so much. Go and and how can people um, watch your podcast and or or get in touch with you? Uh, we are on all the podcast platforms. You can find us at theangrycatholic.com. We're on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Google Play, CRD, FM Radio out of Dubuque, Iowa. So we actually have two slots on their programming now. So we're pretty excited. We're <laughs> saying we're going to do a video for a long time. And it's, it's you know, it, in our spare time, we're trying to figure that whole thing out. But we will. We'll get there. We'll get there. I, I encourage. I inc- but no, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. God bless you both. Thank you.